Please open with me in your Bibles to the Gospel by Mark, chapter 3. We're continuing. This is our third week looking at the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, the, the group I call the master's men, those hand-picked men that Jesus chose to be his servants. These were a unique group of men uh, on all the earth. They were the ones that got to know God, the Son, face to face. They knew his voice. They felt his touch. They saw him minister. They saw his tears. He said, I want you to be with me. Often we think about the disciples as Jesus walking down the beach one day and saying, come be 12 apostles and go get crucified for me, and and they just started following him. And it's not actually quite that way if we study the passages of the New Testament. And that's what we're going to do this morning. And for some of you in your minds, I'll tell you ahead of time what we're going to do. We're going to look at a chronological analysis of Jesus calling this group of men. And what we're going to find, if you put all four of the Gospels together, and when you do put all four of them together, it's called a harmony of the Gospels. And then when you take that harmony and you divide out the events, and by the way, the New Testament has 250 different events in the Gospels, when you divide those out and put them and line them up, you have what's called a chronological harmony. And when you do that, you find that Jesus, according to the men I read this week, called his disciples three times, four times, five times, and one man even went so far as to say six times. Six different, distinct, biblically presented calls, each one with a different response. And that's what we're going to examine this morning. Those 12 men who changed the world, who Jesus called to be his apostles, as we examine the pages of the four Gospels closely, we find that Jesus, first of all, called them to salvation. And after that, he called them to successive, deeper, and more heavily committed phases of ministry for him. In other words, he did not call them at the first instant when they recognized him as their Lord and Savior to the level that they later were to live out. It's a fascinating study as we look at it this morning. This morning, this is the third in our study of the Twelve. The first many weeks ago, we looked at the Master's men, that they were loyal to Christ to the end of their life. We saw how every one of them died faithful to Christ. Some crucified, some uh, beaten to death, some dragged, some, you know, horribly cut up with swords. Terrible. But they were loyal to Christ to the end. Last time we saw that these men were drawn by the perfections of Christ. They were men who examined Christ and they looked at his character, they looked at his words, they looked at his deeds, and they saw they were perfect and they were drawn to him in an unusual way. This morning, we're going to see these men were specifically called, called. And we're going to examine, most of all, this call to salvation. As we uh, prepare to read verses 13 through 19, I think it's significant what one author wrote. He said this, he said, 12 men were called, 12 tribes, 12 sons, 12 foundations, 12 gates. There are many 12s in the Bible. But these 12 men were specially marked because their names here left on record in what we're going to read were the 12 men, minus one and plus one, because you know Judas won't be one of the 12 foundation stones of heaven. God will remove him, and I think he'll put in the Apostle Paul. It doesn't say who the 12 are in heaven. But these men, their names are written on the 12 foundation, the gemstone foundation stones of heaven. And this is what this author wrote. He said, while the high and mighty names of the great ones of the earth are now buried in the dust, these 12 men we read about, their names will forever be written on the foundation stones of heaven. Why? Because when Jesus said, come and follow me, they did. And when he said, I want you to be fishers of men, they were. And when he says, I want you to give up all and follow me, they did. And in a similar way to us, though we can't have our names written on foundation stones, we can shine like the stars forever in heaven if we will likewise let Jesus call us to ever deeper levels of commitment to him and be his servants. Starting in verse 13, chapter 3, and he, that's Jesus, went up on the mountain somewhere in Galilee, a special place, and called to him those he himself wanted. That's a very significant 
word to think that when God calls us to himself, it's because he wants us. And they came to him, and what a blessing it is when we respond to God's call. Verse 14, and he appointed 12. By the way, this is the fourth call, chronologically, of the apostles, and that's the one we're going to uh, read right now, his fourth call. When he appointed 12, this is when they became the 12 apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out, apostello, that's the sending out, to preach. They were the sent ones. And to have power to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. And here's the listing. Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, whom he gave the name the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and always last on all the list, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, open our eyes to behold not merely the wonder of your work in these men's lives, but to behold the work that you want to do in our lives. Because after you call us to salvation, when we yield to you as our only hope of salvation, our Master and Savior and Lord, there are greater and greater levels of commitment you wish for us to make to you. You want us to consecrate more and more and more of our lives, of our minds, of our bodies. And I pray that we would be drawn to you and to your call and to respond with more and more increasing giving of ourselves back to you. We love you, O Lord. And we pray for any who are not partakers of your table in truth because they've never been born again, that even this morning you will draw their hearts to see their helplessness, their lostness, and only you as their hope of salvation. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's trace those different calls Christ made. I mentioned he makes four, five, or six. I'll just do them all. Uh, I look at these men, and the first man conclusively proved in his book that Jesus called his disciples three times. Oh, that's great. So I read the next one. He conclusively proved Jesus called him four times. And I thought, wow, that's good too. Then I looked at the next guy. He was even longer book, five times Jesus called. And I said, that's great. I went to the next, six calls. So I just decided he did them all. So I'm going to do all of them too and uh, give you the best because all of them were so conclusive and they're all in the scriptures. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, the book you're looking at right now, the Gospel by Mark, is the oldest of the Gospels. It was the first Gospel written. It was probably the most impressive and the most uh, affecting of the early church because it was first and because, of course, it came through the eyes of Peter. Mark wrote down what Peter saw. And because of that, you'll find over 95% of the stories in Mark's gospel, Matthew and Luke copy. And the Spirit of God draws them to include, in other words, if you took and cut up the, the gospel by Mark and, and, and looked at where it is, it would be found complete, the 95% of it, in Matthew and Luke. Because the Spirit of God prompted Mark to first record this, and of course they were true and the others use it. And so because of that, and because it's the shortest, the other writers, Matthew and Luke and John, add other stories that Mark didn't include. And so that's why to find all these different calls, we have to look at all of the Gospels together. The first call then, since verse 13 is the fourth call, let's look at number one. Turn back with me to the Gospel by John, chapter one. That'll be the first place we look, to the right, the Gospel by John, chapter one. And this first call is what we're going to look at the most this morning. It was Christ's call to the apostles for salvation. Of course, everything begins with salvation. Christ calls them to faith in him as Messiah. And they became believers in Christ. And they became those who embraced him as the Lamb of God who takes away their sin. That begins in verse 35 uh, of chapter 1 of the Gospel by John. And uh, the story picks up again the next day. John stood with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist with two of his disciples. John had disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, if you look at verse 29, he said the same thing already once before. John 
has already pointed to Christ and said, and that was what his job was as the forerunner, the herald. He pointed to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God in verse 29. The next day, it says, John stood with his disciples and pointed at Christ again. And he's going to lose his disciples, you're going to see, because, because he pointed out Christ was the Lamb of God, and he says, I'm not the Lamb of God, he's the Lamb of God. His disciples stopped following him and began following Christ. He was a very humble man. He, didn't, he wasn't in it to build something for himself. And so, verse 37, those two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And they start asking questions. You can read about all this. But look at the conclusion to this is in chapter 2, verse 11, because this is the clearest. And by the way, to find an exact description of how Jesus led his 12 disciples of the Lord, you can't find. We don't have any account of the conversion like we do of Wesley or the conversion of Augustine or the conversion of, of any of these great persons in the past. What's interesting is the gospel writers assume that you understand these 12 men were converted. And what I believe, and, and it helps us understand what I'm going to share with you this morning, the gospel presentations Jesus makes in the gospel record are what those apostles had embraced and believed. And so it, it's kind of like... Uh, learning by inference. But the closest we get is verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And look, his disciples believed in him. They were saved. They were converted. They saw the miracles. Now, John had pointed him, said he's the the Messiah, the promised one. John the Baptist had pointed at him. So they kind of came out to check it out. And they watched and they listened And they heard, and then verse 11 of chapter 2, they believed, they received, they embraced. And that's why, as it says uh, back in John chapter 1, verse 12, this is the gospel, but to as many as receive him, John 1, 12, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. They received him. So what was the first call that the apostles received? It was a call to salvation. Did they drop everything and follow him? No. No. They went back to fish. Did they never get out of his presence? No. They left him to go on his way, and they went back to the seashore. And so what we find is this first one, they became occasional companions. If you read, and we don't have time, but verse 13 of chapter 2 says that some of them went with Jesus to Jerusalem. And so since everybody else was going to Jerusalem, they all three times a year went up for the feast. The apostles, before they were fully the apostles, these disciples Follow Jesus. But what we find is they occasionally followed him, not completely. Number two, let's look at the second level of their call. That's back in Matthew chapter 4. So go back to the first gospel, the fourth chapter. Here, in a chronological harmony of the gospels, is the second call of these 12 men. And remember, the reason why every gospel writer doesn't contain all these is each gospel is written around a central purpose and all of his stories about Christ's life are arranged to show that purpose. John to show that Jesus is divine, Luke to show his perfect humanity, Mark to show him as a perfect servant, and Matthew to show him as the perfect one to sit on the throne of David, the perfect Jew, as it were, and the perfect fulfillment as Messiah. So each one arranges, and and even the Gospels are not written chronologically by and large. They're written topically around their theme. And so that's why we have to jump all over to isolate these four. Number one, the call to salvation. Number two, the call to witness. Chapter four of Matthew's Gospel, verse 18. And we all know this when we've heard this. And it says in 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting their net in the sea. Now, wait a minute. Is that the first time he saw those fellows? No. In Mark, he'd already seen them walking with John the Baptist. They'd already been drawn to Christ. They'd already, by this time, walked all the way down to Jerusalem with him and celebrated the Passover. They were at the wedding in Cana with him. But now look what Jesus does. Jesus says to them, verse 19, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Their first call was to embrace him as their salvation, as their Savior, as their Lord, as their one who was the promised Messiah. And they responded to that call. And they accompanied Christ. The second call was a deepening of their commitment. 
He said, secondly, I want you not only to be saved, I want you, look at verse 19, to be fishers of men. This is the call to witness. This is a call to testify. This is the call to not merely be a spectator and say, wow, he's turned the water into wine. Wow, he's healing these people. Wow, he cleaned the temple. Wow, he's doing all this stuff. This is the call to get involved and tell people about it. You see, and all of us can experience this. We're all at some level in our life. Uh, If you're a born-again Christian, you've responded to Christ's call to salvation. But have you responded to his call to witness? Did you know, by and large, most Christians don't. And if they do, they're kind of scared to death. It, it is an art. It is a practice. It's a giftedness for some people. Some people, and some even sitting here, I mean, they, they stuff their pockets with tracks, and I mean, they can't wait to witness to people. One wife told me her husband left hundreds of tracks all over northwest United States on a business trip. Most of us aren't that way. I was just on a, an EE team uh, two weeks ago, and, and the, the leader said to one of the, the trainees, he says, and you're next. And they went, I'm next? Me? Right now? I mean, they're an EE. They were expecting it. They signed up for it. But on the moment, they just went, me? I'm next? Now? I, I do the knock? And he said, yeah. They said, okay. That's how most of us feel, you know. And, but boy, once they knocked and started talking, it was great. But most of us aren't comfortable witnessing. But we need to realize Christ's patience. And he's patience. In the second stage, fellowship with Christ assumed the form of, of following Christ around as his witness. Now, they didn't stay with him all the time. We'll see in just a moment. They went back to their work. But I love this. Christ calls all of us in a similar way. First, he calls us to salvation, apart from which no other call will be effective. Then he calls us progressively to more specific and ever-expanding service. And part of what I want you to think about is, if you are in the kingdom, if you have been called to salvation, if you're born again, are you heeding Christ's call to ever expanding and deepening and higher levels of commitment to serve him with your life? Because the apostles did. Call number two, Matthew 4, Christ called a witness. And uh, it says in verse 20 of chapter 4, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And uh, they ran into James in verse 21 and John, and uh, they were mending their nets. And and verse 22, and immediately they left their nets and their father and followed him. Now, most of us, when we read that, we think, wow, that's it. That was the big call. No. Turn to Luke chapter 5, because this is the third call. Guess what they're back doing by Luke chapter 5? They're back in the boats. They only left their nets for a while. They were called to salvation, and they were saved without a doubt. Then they were called to this ministry of witnessing, and you know what? They began to get involved in it. They began to stand with Christ. They began to proclaim with him. They began to agree with him and and acknowledge that what he was saying was true. But at the end of the day or the end of the Passover trip or whatever, they'd, they'd hike back up to their homes in Capernaum and Bethsaida and go back to fishing. Now look at Luke chapter 5. This was the third calling of Christ, the third phase of their training. And it's Christ's call for them to become his learners or his interns, to stay with him all the time. And at the time of this third call, Peter, James, and John were back fishing, Luke chapter 5. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, they stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. And the fishermen had gone from them. They were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats which was Simon's, he's still a fisherman, and asked him, Simon Peter, to push him out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, now this is the climactic moment, Simon was with Jesus when he was teaching. He was witnessing, he was attesting, he was standing up with Christ, but he was still a fisherman. He hadn't made that complete jump in with both feet. So Jesus is going to give him a little, little lesson. Launch out in the deep and let down your nets. But Simon says, Master, verse 5, we toiled all night. We caught nothing. In other words, they had skilled fishermen. They had done their, their fishing routine all night, got not even one. But look at this. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. 
And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, so their net was breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. What had happened was there was a providential, miraculous redirection of every fish in the Sea of Galilee. I mean, all night long, Peter had been chasing the fish, and not one of them got near his net. Now he's sitting by the shore. And the Lord says, put out your nets. And he put out one, by the way. The authorized version picks up on this. You notice Jesus said, put out your nets, plural, in verse 4. And in verse 5 at the end, Peter put out his net. And it says later that the net was breaking at the end of verse 6 and began to sink. Uh, They came to help them with the net. Peter wasn't even willing to, I mean, you know, he says, man, it's a big deal to unload the whole, all my nets. I'll just put one out. And he almost sunk the boat with one. And what God had done is he'd rerouted every fish in the sea. And what he taught Peter was, if you'll come with me and don't trust in your own skill, trust in mine, I will do great and miraculous things. And look, Peter got the message. Simon Peter, verse 8, fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me, I am a sinful man. And and it wasn't just Peter that saw it. All who were with him, verse 9, were astonished at the catch which was taken. So also were uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And Jesus said to Simon, the end of verse 10, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. He said, remember, I asked you to be fishers of men. Now look at this. This is the climactic third call. This is a, a milestone. Verse 11. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. This third call is the one most of us think is the first call, but it was a progressive dealing the Lord had with them. I think we should be understanding of God's patience with these men. If you look at them, they were imperfect. They had so many rough edges. They had so many problems, so many just just bad habits. And the Lord patiently kept working with them. Now, what is he doing in this time? During this phase, this third phase, this you could call internship or learner's phase, They were never far from Jesus. And what they learned was that they couldn't do anything. They were totally inadequate without him. They'd go out and they'd go preach and nothing would happen. They'd come back and they'd say, what's wrong? And he says, you didn't pray. And so they'd go out and they'd try and cast out a demon. Didn't work. they say, what's wrong? He says, this kind cometh not but by fasting and prayer. You've got to be totally yielded and trusting. And so they learned their inadequacies. And after these short periods of active service, they always would come back and Christ would teach them more. Because these humble fishermen had so much to learn before they could satisfy the high requirements of being the apostles, they were apprentices for that fourth call. Now, back to Mark chapter 3. Now, the fourth call. Okay, back to Mark's gospel chapter 3. Number 1, John 1, 35 through 2, 11, the first call, Christ's call to salvation. Number 2, Matthew 4, 18 to 22, Christ's call for them to witness. Number 3, in Luke 5, 1 through 11, Christ's call for them to be interns or learners and to be with him all the time. And they took up the call. They were with him from Luke 5 on. They stayed with him. That's from Luke 5, 1 through 11 on is where they ate and slept and walked and boated and did the dusty trails. They, this is a time we know them from Luke 5 on when they are with Christ constantly. Fourth call, Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Here's the fourth call of Christ. It's the fourth level. And it's Christ's call to be the twelve. And Jesus here equips them with two things. He tells them, if you notice, in verse 14, he sent them out to preach. To preach. So he gave him a message. He said, I want you to say this. And, and he, he gave them a message as his heralds. And they were to go out in the authority of Christ and proclaim that message. Secondly, he gave them power. And if you notice what it says, and verse 15, to have power. Authenticating power, miraculous power, supernatural power. Christ gave that to them. And we'll study that in the future. They were to cast out demons because they had a power in their lives. And when we look at them, we would do well to think of these first disciples as such examples to us of Christ's patience, of Christ's progressive nature of his call, and of the fact that there is a high reward for those who will respond to Christ's call. Now, 
This morning, I want to back up and uh, take you to chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel because this is what I want you to think about. Just the first call. We're going to look at the other calls. We're going to look at the deepening levels of commitment. But Christ's first call to those apostles was to salvation. I have to confess to you, I, I never have done this before. This week, one of the goals I had was I got a brand new Bible and I read the Gospels. On, on unmarked pages, and I looked for every time Jesus Christ presented an identifiable call to salvation or described what a born-again person would look like. It was a fascinating study. And I want to show you just, by the way, there are 30 different gospel presentations in the book of Matthew. There are nine, at least nine, in the book of Mark that I found, and there are about 25 in Luke, and I haven't finished John yet. But let me just, I'm only going to show you the nine in Mark's Gospel, and you might want to note these. And there might be more, but I mean, I I poured over literally every word. In fact, I read every word, every verse twice, trying to see, because you don't find the back of Gospel tracts in the New Testament Gospels. You don't find little prayers to pray, and you don't find these long explanations of do this this and this and this and this and this and this to get saved. What you see is a record of what Jesus said to the multitudes or what Jesus said, only these will get to heaven. And so what you have to do is infer what it was that he was saying in the context of them. And that's what I call gospel presentations. Here's the first one, verse 15 of chapter 1. Here's the first gospel message. Remember, in our Bibles, Matthew records no less than 30 different gospel accounts. We'll do those later. But this morning, our focus is on Mark, and Mark gives us nine gospel insights. Here's the first one, verse 15. This is Christ's first recorded uh, words in this gospel. The first time he talks in Mark's gospel is fascinating. What's the first thing Jesus says in the gospel by Mark? Verse 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So it's very simple. Repent and believe in the gospel. What's the gospel? The good news. The Messiah has come. The one to take your place. The Lamb of God. Repent and believe. Now look at chapter 2, verse 5. Here's the second one. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven. So a born-again person repents and believes, and their sins are forgiven. Now what's interesting is it doesn't talk about how they do that. And it doesn't give them a pattern to follow. It is an assumption of a supernatural event taking place inside of them. They have biblical repentance. They have biblical faith. They have forgiven sins, which we can't forgive our sins. Look at verse 17. Fascinating what Jesus says. Again, he's talking. And he says in, in verse, I mean chapter 2, verse 17, not chapter 1. In chapter 2, verse 17, he says this. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now look at this. This is the gospel. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What does he say? I came to call sinners to repentance. What was Jesus' gospel message? Jesus came to find people who admit they were sinners and call them to repent of their sins. That's his gospel message. I mean, he came to call sinners to repentance. Look at chapter 3, verse 35. And, and I was sharing with Bonnie this week. I mean, I, I, whenever I see her, I, I update her on what I'm learning. I said, honey, the way Jesus shared the gospel, I don't think I've ever done it that way. I mean, he, he said it totally different than we would say it. I mean, can you imagine going over here to the springs and knocking on the door and saying what verse 35 says, saying... Hi, I'm from Tulsa Bible Church, and whoever will do the will of God will be my brother and sister and mother. He'd look at you and say, what are you talking about? He's talking about being born again, being in the family of God, being his brother, his sister, related to him forever in heaven. But did you catch how he said you get there? Doing the will of God. What a description of salvation. It's not... Uh, by the way, I, I knocked on another door with the team I went out with last week, and it was my turn to knock, and I knocked, and I was talking to him. I said, uh, uh, what would you say, you know, whatever that you were supposed to say, what would you say if God asked you how to get in heaven? I was floored. You know what? The, the lady looked at me, and she said, I'd tell him I deserve it. She meant it, too. 
I didn't know what to say. I couldn't answer her. But I mean, you know, it was astounding. What am I talking about? Because the scriptures say that we were born lost and deserving only of the destruction of eternal separation. But the Lord says, you want to go to heaven? Mark 3.35, do the will of God. Here's another one. Look at chapter 4, verse 8. Would we describe salvation this way? Jesus said, the, one, the, 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 the hero of this story is the seed that fell on good ground, yielded a crop, sprang up, increased, and produced some 30, some 60, and some 100. What's he say salvation is? Mark 4, 8. Salvation is when the word of God comes up in someone's heart, when it grows in their heart, when it produces a crop. You know what I wrote in my notes? Germination, growth, and fruitfulness. Okay, let's go across the street, knock on a door, and say, have you germinated, grown, and are you fruitful? In, in the word of God. And they'd look at you and they'd say, they'd shut the door. You know, they, see... We, we don't think of salvation in terms that Jesus talked about. Jesus talked about it as being people, being like soils, the word of God that we share as we live, as we talk, as we pass out tracts, as we witness to our family and friends and schoolmates and all that. When we give out the word of God, it's like seeds. And what he said is, those seeds will fall, and they will fall sometimes on good hearts, and that good heart will receive the Bible, that word will begin germinating inside, it will grow, and it will start producing fruit. We think that if they will just momentarily say something with us, that they're saved. The Lord looked at it a little differently. He looked at it as a long-term transformation, had an initial beginning, a point of beginning, a reception, a confession, but it had a long-term result in the life. Here's the next one. Chapter 8, verse 34. Now imagine this. Let's go to our Christmas party or Thanksgiving. You have some unsaved relatives there. And you say in verse 34, because when he called the people to himself, Jesus says, everybody, come on, all of you. Remember, thousands of people were jostling and crowding around. He's healing them and everything. And, and after he did all that and had this huge group, they'd all come. He said, come on close, I'm going to teach. He called them all up in verse 34. And he says, uh, he cr- called the crowd to him along with his disciples who were learning. And he said, if you would come after me, wait a minute, Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the one who says that, that I am come down from heaven and I'm going back to heaven and I'm the one who is the only way of salvation, that one is talking. So that's who's talking, Jesus. He said, if you want to come with me, what would you assume he's asking you to do? Go to heaven. Go with him. To be identified with him. You must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Jesus had a four-step gospel presentation here. Come, deny, take, and follow. We don't usually say that. And Jesus did. And you know what most people did? They left. John chapter 6 says, after Jesus gave a similar message the majority of the people. They said, we don't want anything to do with that. It's too hard. Look at chapter 9, verse 43. Here's a graphic one. Uh, now, this one, it took a while, and you might not agree, but I think this is a salvation presentation. And uh, I added it to my list as number seven. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life, he's talking about eternal life, maimed, than with two hands to go to what? Hell. This is a salvation message. Heaven and hell. Enter life eternal life, or go to hell, eternal death, eternal separation, eternal punishment. He says this. He says, anything that hinders your salvation, put it off. Now, it doesn't mean you have to saw your arm off to get to heaven. It means that you can't hold on. I always remember when I was little and used to tell flannel graph, you know, uh, child evangelism stories. That one story about the monkey and the coconut, how they catch monkeys are used to for zoos. They would take a coconut, wrap a string around it, throw it with a rock inside the coconut after they'd hollowed it out into the jungle, and the monkey would pick it up and go, and it would hear the sound, and it'd stick its hand through the hole, grab the rock, and its fist couldn't come out of the hole. And it would give up its freedom because it wanted whatever that thing was it found in the coconut, so they'd just pull the rope, and then they'd whack the monkey's arm, and it'd hurt, and it'd fall into the cage, and it had been captured. And I think about that so often with people, that they're willing to hold on to the rock of their sin, and it, they become a slave to that. You know what Jesus says? Let go of anything that will hinder you from having salvation. That's what he says about cut it off. It doesn't mean 
to maim ourselves. He means to deny anything that will hinder salvation. Drop it. Do whatever it takes to embrace Christ. Now, here's the last one we're going to look at this morning. Chapter 10, verse 15. And this is the strongest presentation of the gospel in the book of Mark. And this is what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. He always spoke the truth. He was the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, listen to this, will never enter it. The word never, let me tell you what it means in Greek, okay, because I spent a long time, I read a lot of commentaries. Do you know what it means in Greek? Never. It's one of the most strong prohibitions. He, he left no ground. He said, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you will never. In fact, William Lane, the great Greek grammatician and scholar, said this. He said, the solemn pronouncement is directed to the disciples, but is pertinent for all men because it speaks of the condition to the kingdom of God being never allowed except with childlike access. I thought, well, what does it mean to be a child? Well, some of us might say innocence. Really? After this service, why don't you go to the two-year-old room and see if you see any innocent children in there. I mean, they are bashing and knocking and pulling and punching in there. Not really. Probably just my kids. You know what I mean. But I've never seen any innocent kids in my life. I mean, they're born selfish and angry at times and, you know, whatever. He's not talking about innocence. He's saying this, no one will get in the kingdom of God unless he or she receives God's salvation like a child. He's talking not about the subjective beauty of children. They're simple and beautiful and receptive. He's talking about this. Every child ever born on this planet from the first two children, Cain and Abel, all the way through the last one have one thing in common. Every child born in this world comes in like this. Helpless, absolutely helplessly dependent. They will die if someone doesn't grab them, scoop them up, make them start breathing, clean their mouth out, hold them upside down, give them the proverbial whack, and start feeding them. And they're that way for a long time. They're absolutely helplessly dependent. The only way we can get to God is in the condition of hopeless dependence on Him alone for our salvation. And you know what? That constitutes a humble approach to God. In fact, the great song, some of you know, Rock of Ages, listen to the third stanza. Nothing in my hand I bring. I just talked to a dear friend, not doing well, and I say, how do you know you're getting to heaven? He always tells me the same thing. I was baptized when I was 13 or 12. You know what? He's going to heaven with something in his hand. His baptism. Talk to someone else and they say, you know, I was better than I was bad. You know, I was a little more good than bad. No. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Absolute, hopeless, helpless dependence. Only Christ. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. What's the biblical meaning of verse 15? It's coming to Christ like this. It's his grace plus our nothingness. Nothing I can add. No good. No deal I make with God. No, I'll give that up if you do this. It's absolute helpless. It's a baby that cannot feed, care, provide. I wonder, have you come to Christ as your only hope? Let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. Those who come in helpless dependence and humility, Jesus said, I'll save. Well, how do we get saved? Jesus describes it. Repent, believe, have your sins forgiven. Calling sinners to repentance. They will do God's will. They'll germinate the word of God, grow within them. They'll be fruitful. They'll come to him, deny themselves. They'll take his offer. They'll follow him. They'll say no to anything that will hinder their salvation because they came in helpless dependence to him. That's the gospel Jesus presented. It's the only, you won't find any other gospel presentations in the book of Mark. I shared with First Service, that's why there's a whole group called the Acts 9 Dispensationalists. They're followers of a guy named Bullinger. They say that the New Testament church doesn't start until Acts chapter 9 with Paul. They said Jesus, you know, didn't get it. You know, that's Old Testament stuff. It's not Old Testament stuff. If Jesus doesn't understand the gospel, nobody does. Okay? Nobody does. Jesus is the gospel. 
And this is how he said, Come helplessly dependent to me. Father in heaven, I thank you for this moment. I thank you that as Mark records you saying, salvation is impossible humanly. And anything that we could do that would make you save us is not in this book. It's impossible to humanly trigger. It is a gracious bestowment on those who helplessly come before you asking for your favor, for your forgiveness, for your new heart, for your cleansing. And when we do that, And when by faith we receive that precious gift, you are the God whose grace is greater than all of our sins. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.